Hi guys, welcome to our online experience. It's our desire that we impact you to impact the world. So stick around for some thoughts and some next steps to change your everyday life. What's up, I-5? How y'all doing? Come on, that's weak. What's up? Y'all good? It's good to be back home. Uh, I was in Cleveland last weekend uh, at Journey Church, and man, God just wrecked the place. It was awesome. Uh, I preached a message that I preached a few Sundays ago here called Yes and Amen, but there's no place like home. I'm just glad to be back with my peoples. Come on. Come on. Uh, we, uh, we're just excited what God is doing uh, in our house. We, you know, I, I just believe like, you know, your best days are ahead of you. I believe your worst days are behind you. And, uh, and we, we kicked off this series, Hunger and Thirst. Uh, and in scripture, uh, it says here uh, that, that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And now here's the deal. Like life will make you feel empty. Come on, somebody. Huh? Like life will, th- will literally drain the energy out of you. It'll drain sometimes the hope out of you. It'll drain your faith sometimes. And I believe that at the end of this series that you will be able to step into another level of energy, another level of faith and belief that God has something in store for you. I'm going to jump right in. Is that all right? Uh, I believe there's, like, this is going to be awesome. Like, it's, it, I'm trying to tell you, I was so happy about this message uh, when the Lord dropped it in my heart. And uh, uh, I want to I start by telling you a story. Uh, a few months ago, uh, Will and I, uh, Will was just on the keyboard. Uh, whenever I travel, I take somebody for accountability. It's a whole other message about accountability. Uh, but we went to, uh, we went to uh, R- Rochester, New York. And when we went to Rochester, New York, normally when I go in to preach, you know, I'm, I'm just like, I'm telling the pastor, like, like, it's not a big deal. Like, just send whoever, you know, we'll get a rental car, we'll meet you at the church, you know. But they always want to roll out the red carpet. And, and it's absolutely hilarious because they don't know I'm from Jimmy from Odenton. Y'all know what I mean? And if you spell it backwards, it spells nothing to do, right? So, um, and so we, we, we get there at the airport and they send this guy, uh, he looks like, he's like 10, you know, to pick us up from the airport. And man, he made us feel so comfortable. Like as soon as we got in the van, he's like, yeah, I'm new at this. And they just taught me how to drive this van like last week. I'm like, awesome, awesome. And I mean, he was just green and, and you know, he was started telling us his story and he's about to get married and you know, he's about to graduate Bible college and he wants to be in ministry. I'm like, don't do it, bro. Like do something else, you know? It's hard. And, uh, and so, we're, you know, he's like, well, what do y'all want to do? I'm like, well, look at me. I want to eat. Come on. And so, and so I'm like, you know, we're going to go to this barbecue rib place. And we go get some, you know, we, we pull in. And, and as we're pulling in the city of Rochester, there's like a small uh, parking spot. And he says, well, I'm going to park there. But he's got a van. And I'm just not talking about a regular van. It's like one of those, like, vans, like, uh, uh, like a Mercedes van. You know, it's got like, you know, 15 seats in it, you know. And, and I'm like, bro, that, that's not going to fit right there. And so we pull up, and all of a sudden we start backing up. You know, when you parallel park, you know, he doesn't put his hand over the seat. You know, you're supposed to put your hand over the seat to look back. And all of a sudden, bam! It was awesome. We got in an accident. And we were in the middle of, of, of Rochester. I'm hungry in an accident. You know, it's going to delay the ribs. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting there, and, and when we hit the guy, it was like this guy didn't know what to do. He, I mean, you know, he, not just, he, he had not just, just learned how to, you know, drive this van. He had never been in an accident before. And so he's frozen. And I'm like, um, hey, bro, you're going to have to get out and address this situation. <laughs> and so he was like, you should have seen it. He was beat red, and, and uh, he got out of the, the van, and he came back, like, immediately. Now, the rest of the story has nothing to do with my sermon, but it's really good, so I'll tell you. And he came back immediately, and I'm like, you're supposed to get the guy's information. He goes, he wouldn't talk to me. This guy was mad. And I was like, it's okay. You got the right people in the car with you, you know? I'm not in my city. and got to worry about people from my church hitting us, you know? And so... Uh, uh, I'm like, you, 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 well, he's got to talk to you. I said, well, what I want you to do, I said, you need to pull over to the side. And so we start to pull over to the side, and this guy behind us is following us. Come on. I'm like, it's about to go down, MMA style. He's following us. And I'm like, Will, you see this? And Will's like, yeah. I was like, bro, we about to handle business. I ain't got my security with me. You know what I'm saying? And so we get out the car, me and Will. You know, let's go give the guy scared to death. 
So we get out the car, we go back there, and unbeknownst to us, uh, you know, the, the van had a hitch on it to pull a trailer. So when he ran into the other car, he hitched the car. And not only did we hit this guy and he's upset, now we're dragging him with us. Come on! And police came and it was awesome and it so helped at this message today. But let's rewind a little bit in that story. This guy got into an accident. There was damage and he had no idea what to do. And I started thinking about like driving school. Like driving school will tell you how to drive, but does driving school tell you how to recover when you got in an accident? And, and I, I think that's so much like, you know, so many areas in our lives. And, and you know, whether, when you get something new out of the package, and especially like Ikea, any of y'all ever bought like furniture from Ikea? And you got to put it all together. And it gives you all the instructions on how to put it together, but no instructions for if it breaks. Kind of like church. This is one area that I feel like the church has failed. We've taught people how to put their lives together. We've given people standards to live by. We say, you know, go to your word. But we don't do well when people wreck their lives. We don't do well when people fall from their call. We don't do well when people fall into sin once they're already in the church. We don't do well when people just disappear and there's no relationship and there's no line of communication to get them back in the right place that God has for them. I believe that this church should be a place where people know how to recover. I believe that the church should be a place where people know how to put their lives back together once they've been damaged. I'm not talking about the time when you found God. I'm talking about some people who found God, who through life and circumstances feel like they've lost God. If I were to title this message, which I am going to give it a title, I, I want to talk from this point, how to move back from your falling to your calling. See, many of us, we fell. Many of us, we've set standards in our lives that we've, you know, for some reason or another, fell beneath the standard. And here's, and here's what we think. Like, people are going to judge us. Like, I don't want to tell anybody my junk because if I told them my junk, that, you know, they wouldn't like me. If I told them my junk, then I wouldn't be invited to their small group. If I told them my junk, they wouldn't really want to sit next to me. Okay, can I just give you some good news? We all got junk. Can I give you some good news? There are no perfect people allowed in this church. Can I give you some good news that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory? But what do we do when we fall? What do we do when we blow it? What do we do when we wreck our lives? Where is the instructions on how to pick up the pieces of this shattered life that I have that got broken in a relationship when my relationship fell apart? When my finances fell apart? What do we do when we're walking through divorce? And, and you know, what, what does the church think about divorce? Here's what the church thinks about divorce. God loves you. In spite of whatever you walk through, he loves you. I think about what God, God, there's nothing you can do for God to give up on you. That's good news. Like somebody should like say an amen right there or something. Y'all got quiet on me like. I want to talk and highlight this, the, the process of moving from my falling back to my calling with the life of David. David was a great man of God. King David. David was a kid who was anointed as a king and he fought Goliath and he beat up giants and he was obedient and, and, and listened to his dad and, and, you know, he ended up, you know, soothing Saul's spirit with, with, with Saul was troubled with dreams and, and David was called in. He got God's favor. But David blew it in his life. You see, we know the exploits of David. 
And, you know, if we, if we were to fast forward, we can say, man, David was called a man's after, after God's own heart. But this warrior and this worshiper also had a moment in his life where he was a womanizer. What did David do to move from his falling back to his calling? 1 Samuel 16, 12 through 13 says, so Jesse sent for him. Jesse was David's father. I love this. He was dark and handsome. Doesn't that sound like me? <laughs> and the Lord said, this is the one. God had sent Samuel to David's house because Saul was disobedient to anoint David to become the king of Israel. So David stood there amongst his brothers and Samuel took, and what I have here is, is some anointing oil. And, and he brought it to David and he anointed David. And I love this last uh, line in this, or this last sentence in this, in this text. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. I love that. From that day on. From that day on, even though David would mess up, he was still anointed. Even though David would, <laughs> would screw his life up, he was still anointed. Even though David would make a bad decision and involve other people in his junk, from that day forward, he was still anointed. Not the kind of, you know, assurance that I can slip up because I'm still anointed, but the kind of assurance that if I slip up, I'm still anointed. I want you to know that when God anoints you, when God calls you, he gives you what you need, not to just get to the place that he's called you to, but he gives you what you need to get through the stuff that you'll go through. Y'all, what's, what's up with y'all today, man? Y'all ain't, y'all ain't been through nothing? I know in my life I've needed the anointing of God to get through hard moments. Hard moments where I wanted to quit. Hard moments where I felt like giving up. Hard moments when I disqualified myself. But God still had a call and a destiny on my life. Hard moments, come on. When I said I'd never do it again, I ended up doing it like five more times. Any of y'all want to be real? Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you so I can feel like I'm not by myself. Okay, good. But David had a call of God on his life. The Bible says that David, that in his generation, he served the purposes of God. Like, don't you want that said about you? That no matter what, in your generation, you serve the purposes of God. That's the call of God on your life. The call of God on your life is not that you go to church. The call of God on your life is not that you preach the gospel one day. The call of God on your life is that you would go all in with your skills, your abilities, and your gifts, and they would serve a greater purpose than yourself. Every single one of you have a call of God on your life, no matter where you come from, no matter your background, no matter what you're going through right now, God has called you in his purpose and for his purpose. It's the anointing on your life. You see, when you're called and God anoints you like he anointed David, like David didn't kill the lion and the bear in the wilderness because he was strong. He killed the lion and the bear in, in the wilderness because he was anointed. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't go up against Goliath because he had great confidence. He was able to confront Goliath because of the call and the anointing on his life. David wasn't able to choose five stones just because he was good at preparation. No, 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 no. It was because the anointing and the call was on his life. David was able to kill Goliath because of the anointing and the call on his life. David was able to kill the Philistines time and time again and the Amorites because of the anointing and the call of God on his life. David was able to conquer sin and the consequences of sin because the anointing and the call of God on his life. You have a call of God on your life that will enable you to move from your falling back to your calling. In fact, if I'm honest with you, I have found in my life that a great call will be coupled with a great fall. 
Like, I know we want it easy. Right? Come on, somebody. God's not the, the God of easy. He's the God to see if you can take a licking and keep on ticking and work through some stuff so that you can have something not called a victory but a testimony where somebody else sees your strength through difficult times so that they can get courage to get over what they went through because you overcome, you overcame the odds of the enemy coming up against you and you stayed in there and you still came to church and you still kept fighting and you still kept believing and you still kept carrying the banner of victory over your life. Can I tell you that victory is not a moment, it's a spirit to carry. I am victorious. I am the righteousness of God. I am the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. You got to learn how to walk in victory when you don't see victory. The fall. He fell. This king, this man who was in the lineage of Christ, he had a junk drawer in his heart. He had issues. Come on, he had jacked up family members. Some of y'all need to give a good amen right there. Come on. He thought thoughts that he shouldn't think. He did things that he shouldn't do. And he still was called a man after God's own heart. Somebody say, it happened. It happened. David fell. David went from a great calling to a great falling, back to a great calling. Here's the process. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 5. If you're, can we just welcome all those who are watching on, on Facebook Live? Come on, come on, come on. What's up, Facebook? Y'all in the house. You need to come to the house. Bible says, then it happened. One evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. This wasn't his wife. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Who's that? Verse 3. So David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, that's Bathsheba. That's Uriah's wife. David was like, I don't care. Because it happened. Has it ever happened to you? Have you ever smoked it? Drank it? Cussed it out? He never told anybody about it. So it called him when he wasn't in his call. Oh, my God. It's when you step out of the place that you should be. When the enemy will be there positioned to tempt you. You see, Bathsheba wasn't out of place. David was. Your issue was not temptation. Your issue was purpose. And if you stepped into the purpose and stayed in the purposes of God, you wouldn't see Bathsheba because David was supposed to be at war. Be careful not to get so high and mighty that you can't serve. David is on the roof. He thought about it. It kept him up late at night. It moved right next to him. He fantasized about it. He was vulnerable to it. It took a bath at just the right time that he would see it. It came and worked out right in front of him when he went to the gym. It got hired on your job. Come on, somebody. It followed you on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And although you used to be a part of it, it still wants to be a part of you. Does anybody know about it? Come on, somebody. Does anybody know about it? All of us have an it. What is it? Look at the person next to you and says, what is it? 
what I have found. And people said, Pastor, why are you so transparent? Why are you so vulnerable? Can I tell you why? Because if you don't expose it, it will expose you. Come on. Come on. I sat at a board meeting a few months ago when we moved into this building. And I said, tears in my eyes. I wrote something on a piece of paper. And I don't know if I slid it across the table or talked about it, but as tears was rolling down my eyes, I said, if I'm going to embarrass this church and my family, if I'm going to do something stupid and step out of my call, here are the three things that I would do. Make sure I don't do these things. Why did I do that? Because if I don't expose it, it will expose me. You can't do life alone. So because of it, David had a consequence. He had to live out a consequence. You see, don't get confused with thinking that everybody is judging you just because everybody found out about you. Judgment is not talking about it. Judgment is putting yourself in a position where you think that you wouldn't do what somebody else would do. But just because they're talking about it doesn't mean they're condemning you. It could just be a consequence of you doing it. What I have found is that there is a difference between condemnation and consequence. How many of y'all know about consequence? See, I was the type of child, you had to whoop my tail. Don't take nothing from me. Don't put me in time out. I'm just going to think about how I'm going to get you next. There had to be a consequence to the action. Come on, somebody. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Have bad kids, baby kids. <laughs> Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm saying God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. So he must allow consequences to take place in your life to not change your situation, but to change you. And so some of us are just walking out years of consequence because we had tens of years of sin. No one's judging you. I often preach, don't judge people because they sin differently than you. God loves you. And he loves you enough to allow you to experience consequence that it hurts enough for you to change. Oh my God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Consequences get me back in the way of salvation. You know what consequences do? They bring me to a place of contrition. You know what God wants? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. Let me give you a definition of contrition because it kind of sounds like a big word. Contrition is being remorseful for past sin to the point of it being resolved in your heart to avoid it in the future. I tell my kids this. Like, let me let y'all understand what contrition is. It's not not doing it so you don't get caught. It's not doing it so that you don't break your father's heart. Completely different mindset. Some of us, we say, man, you know, we, we go right up to the line of sin. Just, I just, just don't want to get caught. Don't want to get caught in the consequences. Come on. But man, you, do you know that God can change your desires to the point where you desire to please him more than you desire to please yourself? I'm telling you, man. 
This is David's life. God is doing something in David. You know what the consequence was for David? The child died. The child that was conceived in 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14, it says, Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, God has forgiven you because God loves you and you won't die. But something has to die that you produced so it does not take root and cause generational curses and strongholds in your family. So God, kill it in me so it doesn't live in my son. Oh, my God. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for your seed. The consequence was that, that the child died. The child didn't make it. But God said, you're going to make it. What did he tell Paul? The ship will go down, but you won't drown. That's a good alliteration right there. I'm trying to tell you what happens when you're, in your con when you're in condemnation. See, David was first in condemnation. The Bible says in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15 and 17, after Nathan returned to his home and the Lord sent a de deadly illness to the child David and Uriah's wife, David begged to God to spare the child. He went without food and he laid down on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded to him to get up and eat, but he would not. He refused. He laid down. Many of us are laying down on the call of God in our lives. We're laying down on our destiny. We're laying down on our future. Man, I came to stir you today to do something about it. We're laying down in, 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 in discouragement and we're laying down in fear and we're laying down thinking that we're not worthy and God can't use us because of what he sent to us to change us. And we're laying down. Some of you have decided, man, I'm not even serving in church. I'm not even going to church. And we've laid down. And you know what you do when you lay down? You starve yourself. You starve yourself of the things of God. You starve yourself of the word of God. I'm not reading my Bible no more. You starve, you starve yourself of godly relationships. I'm not going to church anymore. Uh, you, you starve yourself of being fed spiritually. You starve yourself of confidence. You starve yourself of faith. You starve yourself of spiritual authority. And I have met so many people who are so powerful on their job and they can, and they can manage and they can, you know, put things in order and they can arrange. But as soon as they come into the house of God, they have no confidence because they've starved themselves thinking that they're not worthy. How crazy is it that there be a meal on the table and you decide not to eat and you come into the house of God spiritually malnutrition because of your own choices that you're not worthy because you can't forgive yourself. Man, God wants to forgive you, but can you release yourself out of prison that he's already released you from? He laid down. He starved himself. Let's check this out. This dude could kill a bear and a lion with his bare hands. This dude could confront a nine-foot giant. Come on. Name Shaquille. I mean, <laughs> Goliath. This dude was strong. He was a worshiper. This dude could kill so many external things, but he was too insecure to kill the internal things. Some of y'all sitting at me like, I wish he would stop talking about me right now. <laughs> I've been there, guys. Coming to the church, got to preach on Sunday, and thought something that I shouldn't have thought on Saturday. And got to come and give you a word and get myself to the place. The Bible says this, that we are to approach the throne of grace with boldness. You know what that means? Understanding that you can't earn your salvation. Understanding that you are human. Some of us ain't sin, we're just human. And God wants you to get your confidence back. He wants you to operate in his grace. You know what the consequence was in David's life? Check this out. God was not killing his call. 
He was killing his fall. As I studied the scripture this week, I realized that this child was never named. Several times it's called it. And I thought to myself, what do we speak over ourselves and give a name when it was never supposed, we were never supposed to be identified by that? Let me tell you something. If you don't identify it, it can't identify you. Here's the situation. You start calling yourself lazy. Or you start saying, you know, uh, maybe you struggled with a thought from a past relationship. Maybe you struggled with an impure sexual thought. Right? And you start saying, man, I'm lustful. Don't give it a name. Say, I'm called. And I'm having a moment. But I'm still called. If you don't identify it, it can't identify you. Speak those things that be not as if they were. Right? And if you don't know what to say over yourself, just repent. Father, forgive me. But don't say this is who I am now. I'm insecure. I'm fearful. I'm broke. Some of y'all are like, yeah, I need to stop saying that because I, 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 you don't know about my bank account right now. Does that make sense? It doesn't have a name. So here's how you recover from the fall. How many of y'all want to move from the falling to the calling? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're going to do that. Number one, in 2 Samuel 12, 19, 20, it says that when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, yes, the child is dead. Pause. So he fasted and starved himself when the child was sick, praying for God to heal the child. But God had to kill the seed of sin so that David could go on and be the seed of salvation. Whole another sermon. So he killed the seed of sin. Now, verse 20, something changes in David. It says, so David arose from the ground. Another version says, so David got up. Now, what I see here is the position didn't change. The circumstance didn't change. David changed. And, and here, check this out in, in verse 21. Then his servant said to him, what are you doing, dude? You fasted and you wept. While the child was alive, but when the child died, you got up. That does not make sense. Did we miss something? Did the child resurrect? Did, did the child get supernaturally healed and we didn't think about it? Did God give you another child? David said, no, the child didn't get up. I got up. Oh, my gosh. Because God was not after changing the situation. God was after changing David. I dare you to get up. When you feel like crying. You see, I'm not talking about getting up for the day. I'm talking about changing your posture. Because when you change your posture, you will change your position. Are y'all hearing me? And when you change your position, your prayers will change. I'm trying to tell you that David got up. I was thinking about this about 10 years ago. I had back surgery. And I had surgery on my L4 and L5 discs in my back. They were herniated. They were sending pain down my legs. It was horrible. Felt like I got shot in the butt every day. It's okay. Y'all can laugh. <laughs> Be like, shoot it off. How about that? <laughs> and, and it was so bad. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would have to crawl to get to the bathroom because of these pains in my back. And so I went to the chiropractor time after time. Time after time they said, we can't do anything about it. You need surgery. So I went to... Orthopedic Sports Medicine Center, and they said I need surgery. So I had emergency surgery. And let me tell you something. I thought the pain of the injury was bad. I woke up from the anesthesia after the surgery, and the pain was like 10 times worse than the actual injury. Do you know that the pain of recovery can often be greater than the pain of the injury and so I'm in the bed 
thinking that I'm healed. Come on. Hurting. Give me morphine. Come on, somebody. Whatever y'all got, bring it to me now. And the doctor came in. And he says, yeah, we can give you some pain medicine, but that won't help you. Like what I'm about to tell you is going to help you. He says, I know it hurts. But what I need you to do is get out of the bed and walk, even when it hurts 10 times worse. He says, as you begin to walk, molecules and things will be sent to your back. He said, listen, he said, you will be healed as you go. And so many of us want to stay laying down. I'm trying to tell you, I was like, I ain't getting out this bed. I'm going to punch you in your mouth. <laughs> but every step I took, the pain began to go away. It was hard to walk at first, but after a few days, I went from walking to trotting, from trotting to running. Come on, somebody. From running to praising God that the pain was no more. I double dog dare you to get up even when it hurts. I dare you to get up even when you don't feel like it. I dare you to get up when everybody is looking at you and the spotlight is on you and everyone is wondering what are you going to do. I dare you to get up in the face of adversity. I dare you to get up in the face of fear. I dare you to get up in the face of discouragement. I'm not talking about an actual stand up unless that's what, but I'm talking about changing your posture. Your posture that it didn't happen to me, it happened for me. Come on somebody and although the pain is great, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Number one, get up. Number two, the Bible says, so David arose from the ground, washed himself, and anointed himself. Oh my gosh. He got up and he didn't just go right back to being a king. He went through a process of change. See, many of us want to get up and go right back to the thing that we were doing. And although we got up, we were never cleaned up. So we still smell like the old season. And we still are attracting Bathsheba's because we never cleaned up. Although we came to church and got up. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm sorry if I stepped on your feet right there because I had to step on my own in the back room. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that he washed himself. Now, how many of y'all, if you're a man, you used to be a boy as a kid, how many of y'all got sons? Any of y'all got sons in here? It's so hard to get a teenage boy to take a bath. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to tell you, I don't know why it was me. I, I, I like being clean now. But back in the day, you just wanted to go right back outside and play, didn't you? And how many of y'all know that there's nothing worse than smelling like outside? Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about when your kids, no, no, forget your kids, you. It's 90 degrees. You just showered. You walk outside. It's hot as all get out. And all of a sudden, you smell like outside. Man, my kids come in. I'm telling you, if they could package up outside and put it, in a bomb? <laughs> Come on, son. we'd be the greatest country ever. Just, what did y'all do? We threw outside at them. <laughs> so, I got to tell my boy sometimes, dude, in old seasons, in another season, go shower. He's like, I already did. But why you still smell like outside? And what he forgot is I used to be his age. I knew how to go in the bathroom, turn on the water. Come on, somebody. Wet the washcloth. Put a little soap on it. 
Put the washcloth back. Come on, y'all. And fake a bath. How many of y'all be real to say there was a time in your life, come on, come on, when you was a kid that you faked being washed up? Anybody? Come on. Come on. Ladies like, "Uh -uh. uh-uh. Mm-mm. Well, what happened when you fake a bath? What you do is you anoint yourself without washing up. Look at the sequential order. He washed himself and then anointed himself. But sometimes what we do is we either fake a wash up or we don't finish washing up and we smell a little bit like a new season but still a whole lot like a other season. And we get ourselves back in and we anoint ourselves prematurely before we all the way clean. Come on, y'all. Ain't nothing worse than the scent of yesterday and the scent of a new day at the same time. It, it's, it don't even, it's not right. It's called, ready? Mixture. You ever been around somebody and they look like mixture? I'm talking about just, you, you can't look, they can't look you in the eyes because they never finished washing up. Can, can I tell you that there's been seasons in my life that with tears in my eyes, with my reputation on the line, that I had to take some time out to soak a towel and wash the eyes of my imagination. To wash the thoughts that sometimes consume me. To wash my hands from what I touched. To wash my feet from where I've been, just, I gotta wash up. I gotta do it with nobody's help. I gotta get naked before the Lord and tell him everything that he already knows. Have you ever really washed up? Where your past didn't trouble you anymore. Taking time to refresh yourself in the presence of God. I know you want to go to counseling. I know you're going to answer the altar call and ask somebody to pray for you. But can't nobody clean you like when you clean yourself. I know what David prayed in Psalms chapter 51. Can you put it up there? He said, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. He said, Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. God, don't give up on me. Cast me not away from your presence as I wash up. Just take a spiritual bath to clean up all the junk and the grime and the grit from yesterday so I can feel like a new today. And I am calling out to you for a strength exchange. And I'll gladly trade my joy for my weakness. 
give me a clean heart and I will serve nobody but you a new relationship can't clean you up a new job can't clean you up watch me now a new church and a new pastor can't clean you up because when you're dirty you're going to take you wherever you go just clean I mean, how, how many how many of you would just be honest can, can, can y'all stand with me can, can everybody stand with me can, just just I, I got one more thought but maybe you're online watching on Facebook live and you just need to go to your linen closet and get a towel a clean one. Come on, somebody. And, and, and let the Spirit of God pour all over your life and clean you up. You know what happened in John chapter 4? This woman, she's a prostitute. She's at a well and meets Jesus. And Jesus asks her for a drink. Do you know that no matter what you did, God is still asking you for a drink. And she says, I have nothing to draw with. And the well is too deep. She says, listen, th this hole, th this spirit, this bucket, this life has got holes in it. And the pain is too deep. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I know all about your past. But I came to give you water. To clean you up in a way that you could never thirst again. Is anybody be real enough to say, would you walk up front? Just, just, just letting the enemy know. I'm talking about with a good posture, not with a punk posture. Come on, somebody. Just, I know I need to be cleaned up a little bit. Is there anybody just that would be bold enough to say, man, I, I, Pastor, I, 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 fall from, I fell from my call, or I'm falling from my calling, and I, and I just prayed it. that I could clean myself up. Can I tell you something? The Bible says after he washed himself, he anointed himself. And I thought about this last night late. The only way, he's never been anointed but by somebody else. Somebody else telling him he's valuable. Somebody else telling him he's worth something. Somebody else saying, man, you got a purpose and a destiny. But has he ever told himself that you're strong? Have you ever said to yourself, I can do it? Have you ever said to yourself, you know what? Thank God for the mess. Because if it had not been for the mess, I couldn't walk as a miracle. <laughs> can you anoint yourself? Can you become face to face with God? Because what I, you can't anoint yourself till you can forgive yourself. Nobody's judging you. But it could be you might be judging yourself. He, he anointed himself. I love one, one, one version says, he put lotion on. Come on, somebody. Uh, how many of y'all know that after shower, you better put some lotion on? But what I have found and y'all can laugh with me it's okay we're gonna have a good time y'all know what I like to do in church but there's two areas no matter how much you put lotion on that you need to keep lotioning up your hands and them ankles come on somebody looking like you've been kicking powdered donuts around come on because after you wash yourself you gotta constantly anoint yourself so, so here's what I'm gonna do can, can y'all just come in a little bit I, I know you want me to pray for you but I'm gonna give you a bottle of this oil. Now this is, this is probably Pompeii extra virgin olive oil that I got out of my kitchen. It's not in what's in this bottle, it's what is in this bottle signifies. It signifies the anointing of God over your life that you're still called. So I'm gonna give you this bottle. I want you to just dip your finger in it. And when you forgive yourself, just say I'm still called. I'm moving from my fallen to my calling. Can y'all do that? And what we're going to do out here is we're going to stretch our hands towards those at this altar. 
and we're going to sing a little bit because God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's got your back. Can, can, can we do that? And then I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up and we're going to begin to pray for these at this oh, altar after they anoint themselves. Come on. You can oh, take it. No. Ready? When I oh, fall, you're there to, to catch, catch me. me. And when if I, I fall again, you're there to do the same. Lord, you keep the grace around me. You never leave me. Oh, and when I fall, you fail to catch me. And if I fall again, you fail to do the same. you be sure the grace around me. You never leave me. Lord, you be your heart, the grace around me, you never Watch this. Watch this. He, he got up. He washed himself. He anointed himself. Guess what the next thing he did? He changed his clothes. He took off the, the, the garments of mourning what he did. And he put on different garments for a new season. When I, when I studied that, I, he, he changed what he surrounded himself around. He got a new crew. Come on, somebody. He got a new squad. Sometimes you got to just change your influence and change your environment and change the places that you've taken yourself so that God can change you. He, he got up. He, he washed himself. He anointed himself. He changed his clothes. Here's the last one. This was what's crazy to me. Now, how many of y'all, be honest, like you've come into a moment like this before and you just praise God because you got over it. Come on, any of y'all be like, I'm over it. I'm about to praise God. I'm about to jump. I'm about to scream. I feel victorious. Here, check this out. In 2 Samuel 12, 20, you can put it up there. So he arose from the ground, he washed and anointed himself, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Now, some of us have heard this song, when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David. David knew how to dance. But why did he worship and not praise? I, I, I had to study that. I'm like, God, what's the significance that he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped and, and, and here's the Lord dropped in my heart that winning doesn't change you worshiping changes you and some of us we want the victory so bad that we haven't changed the behaviors so we have the victory in one season and we end up back in the same season with Bathsheba over and over and over because winning doesn't change you, worship does. And so when he began to worship God and see himself as acceptable into the house of God, God said, you're not a man after Bathsheba no more. You're a man after my heart. I'm trying to tell you guys, God will never give up on you. And you can move from your calling to your, or from your falling back to your calling. Now, I'm going to be real with y'all. I'm all for consequences. But if I was God back then, you know, I would have let David go through some hard things. Like the next child, you know, is not going to be that awesome. How about right after that? David went back with Bathsheba. I don't understand that. I'm going to preach that another time. And they had a son named Solomon. Solomon's name means peace. P 
peace that surpasses all understanding. And Nathan comes in and says, no, the Hebrew name to Solomon is Jedediah. Jedediah means you belong to God. Even what you did, you don't belong to your past. You don't belong to Bathsheba. You don't belong to your history. Change your posture. You're a child of God. And you belong to the Most High King. Somebody say, I'm moving from my fallen back to my calling. Can we make some noise and give God some praise up in this place? Come on. Come on, y'all can return to your seats. We pray that you were inspired by today's message, but not just inspired, that your heart was stirred to make a decision for Jesus Christ. At I-5 Church, we call that a fresh start. And if you want to make a fresh start for Jesus today, simply repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, come into my heart. Make me new. Give me a fresh start and a new life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See, it's that simple. But we also want to connect with you in a real way. If you can just go to i5city.com and click on Next Steps, you can find the next steps for your journey with God. Now we all have an opportunity to give back to God. Here at I5 Church, we know we don't give to a church, but we give through a church. And there's two ways to give. You can simply click Give on i5city.com or you can text the number 410-567-0645. We hope to see you at our next weekend experience. God bless.